Today's guest is a true friend, a real brother. Yeah, you've been called me since 2003. You, you shut up, Bill. People don't know that. This is Bill Burr, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, hey, I'm Bill Burr. Now, Kevin Hart was somebody that I thought I was friends with, but I realized quickly that he just needed a spot at Dangerfields. <laughs> And then he booked a pilot, and I don't think I talked to him again. I had, like, kids, and I didn't hear from you. Bill Burr, ladies and gentlemen. We're getting to the mind of Bill Burr. Yeah, was late for his own podcast. Bill, are you ready for this? This is the best part that I think. This is this is what's mind-blowing that people are going to love. Bill Burr. Do you have your, your, your own name on your fucking sweatshirt? Well, outside of that, I mean, I don't know why you don't. When are you going to stop Kev? We know who you are. Just in case you didn't, Bill, I wore a shirt to remind you. What's the big fucking deal, man? All right? It's just a shirt. hoodie with Kevin Hart. I hand out <laughs> hoodies to homeless people because I care about downtown L.A. Go see Jumanji Part 19. <laughs> the studio system has ruined you. <laughs> Bill, Bill is not angry, first of all, to our listeners. Bill is not an angry person. Bill is a very happy person. Bill is a married man. He's a father now. Congrats on that, yeah. Bill. By the I got way, two kids. I had another one. I was going to call you, but I knew you wouldn't return the call. No, <laughs> I don't think my last movie did well enough to have you send over your little heart of the city fruit basket. You piece of what are you shit. Talking about? I would have sent you a bottle of heart wine from the vineyard. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? I told you <laughs> it would have got there. Bill, I love you tell have a vineyard. Can we tell the people, Bill, you little ass get out there and stomp on the grapes? <laughs> yeah, I do. So fuck off. I do. Uh, Bill and I did a pilot, ladies and gentlemen. We did a pilot for Comedy Central. It was called Heart of the Shitty, and it wasn't picked up. <laughs> yeah, this is, yes, let me clear this up. This is before I got big. This is before I got big. Bill and I did a show. It was, you were like, it was right before. No, you were already starting to blow up. And I remember there, there was a moment where we were actually going to tour together. We were going to yeah. do the black and white tour because I was almost ready to go to theaters. You had just started going to theaters. And then a week later, you went to arenas. And that, that's when you stopped calling me. No, that, no, no, no. That's when it was, Kev. I stopped calling you after the show got, after the show didn't get picked up because I felt like you fucked me. I said, that, I said Bill Burr You weren't going me. out to the clubs until four in the morning and then showing up thinking you're going to Eddie Murphy your way <laughs> through it and start improvising. You took that whole thing down with you. I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> Bill, I would love if we could get our hands. You opportunity to get screwed over by Viacom. Do you think I'm willing to bet you, Bill, I can probably get my hands on that pilot? I'm willing to bet you I can, man. I would love to get my hands on that fucking pilot just for you and I. Because we can't show it. We can't do shit How with it. How much fun was it? I'm fucking around, but Bruce McCullough, you and me, dude, that was so much goddamn fun. I will, I will say this, man. Bill Burr, for those who do not know it, uh, lately, as of late, I mean, Bill, you, you're just, you're popping up all over the place as far as acting. But the the Staten Island movie, what's the name with Pete Davidson? What's the title of it, Bill? I don't know. It was called uh, Jumanji Part... Uh, it wasn't called Davidson. Jumanji. That's my movie. What oh, the sorry. fuck was it called, man? Uh, Get Hard. Wasn't That's another no, one of no. my movies, Bill. Wait, I get the it. The King I of Staten it. Island? Uh, Soul Plane with White Fuck off. That's, those are my oh, movies, United Bill. Airlines. God damn it. <laughs> he said United Airlines. What was it okay. called, Bill? It's called The King of Staten Island. The King of Staten Island. John right? Apatow. And Pete Davidson, Judd Apatow, who ruined my friendship with you because you you booked his pilot and I never heard from you again. <laughs> you left me, Kev. <laughs> Bill, I'm going to say in this movie, you did what I knew back then when we did that pilot, man. Bill has always been a fucking... You've been a phenomenal comedic actor. And you know they say that we don't have it. They say as comedians, comedians can't, we can't make the transition. A lot of comedians fail Who in making that? that transition. I mean, Who a lot said of people that say specifically. That. Who don't said put that? Donald Trump on me. Don't start telling me that people are saying shit. I well, they're, listen, back. what they're doing, I'm telling you what they're saying. Everybody knows it. You know <laughs> what? I know it. Everybody, everybody knows it. That's my favorite thing. I use that now on my wife. You know everybody. it? I know it. Everybody knows everybody. it. Everybody knows it. What are you saying? <laughs> people say it. People fucking say it. Everybody, everybody says, says it. it. You everybody. know Everybody. I know it. Everybody says it. They've said the comedians couldn't act for years. But Bill Burr, you cracked the code. You cracked the fucking code, man. And back then when we did that pilot, the reason why I bought up you during the King of Staten Island because you did a fucking phenomenal job in that movie. But back when we did that pilot is when I got to see, I was like, yo, Bill can actually fucking act. Bill's good. Because... I was coming in, like you said, with the improv, and I'm coming in with all this shit, and not once were you ever flustered. 
You were never bothered by it. I was annoyed, and I just used that. If that you you were like going out, to, I don't know where the hell you were going out to Sky Bar every damn night, dude. I you said one of the funniest things ever to me on that pilot. It was in between takes, you know, before I shaved my head, I was losing it back here, and they'd come in doing all this stuff. You said, you said, Bill looks like a fighter in between rounds. When we were in between takes, everybody coming in, it was. Out of all the shit people ever talked, I'm not saying it as funny as you said it. But that was one of my favorite things. You know, comedians, we love to get trashed. So that was one of my fav favorite things anybody ever said to me. I, 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 that. I can say during that pilot, you and I, we had a fucking amazing time. We had a blast. And the show actually came out good. The show was funny. Of course, things don't work because they just don't work. But the show was fucking funny, man. And it's the last thing oh, that people would expect to did, see. Though? Which part? Well, what? Because we niced it up. Yeah. What we wanted to do. Remember, what was going to happen? You were going to have a drinking problem, and I was going to have something, but we weren't we going to have edgy. that pilot. Yes. So we did a nicer version of it. You, me, and Bruce. And I go, yes. okay, man, right, once we get the audience, then we'll start getting darker. Then we'll go dark. Yeah. We'll give them exactly what they want. For now? Yeah, let's give it to them now. Yeah, there's no way this isn't getting picked up. It has to. What are you talking about? You, me, bird, look at this. We're right on the cusp. We're, We're about to think them what they want. And then they tell us to go they, fuck ourselves. Fuck it, gave us a big boot. That's what they did. Big boot. Big we got boot. the old industry boot. Bill Burr, uh, from Boston, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not know it. Uh, suburbs. But, Safe suburbs uh, of Boston. Not the good for suburbs. the The suburbs of Boston. Suburbs. They, know, they, the they don't make movies about where I'm from. <laughs> where, where, what part is it exactly, Bill? It's the South Shore, Cat, Massachusetts. I know South Shore. I'm very familiar with that. Music Circus? I mean, I know what the fuck it is. I've been there. I've been around that part. I didn't hear anybody mention you when I was there either. Well, we'll talk about that offline. Are you uh, just doing some road work? Are you like jogging down the street with your hands wrapped? Why are you fucking around? I mm -hmm. swear to God I was. It's what we you know what's funny about you one time? Intelligence. I, remember you, I remember you trying to show me how fast you were boxing. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, Kev, I'm a 40-year-old white comedian. Like, this is not impressive. You should be able to touch me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not I swear to God. For your listeners, we were in some stupid parking lot. And he's going, I'm fast. <laughs> doing all this stuff. I'm just like, all right, Kev, you're fast. I get it. You almost seem taller when you're doing that, Kev. Wow, that's amazing. Hey, I remember, man, I don't think there's anybody that I can annoy more than Bill Burr. I have, I have probably triggered some of Bill Burr's angriest reactions in the New York oh, City no, comedy club. No. No, I'm talking about of annoyance. I remember no. Bill, you were when well, we were teasing no. you one more day. More than Patrice? No. No, Patrice, Patrice used to piss you. More than Chief? No. All right, you're right. I was probably in fourth or fifth no. place. No, you and were you came in quick. You Patrice came in definitely quick. Patrice used to get you. Patrice right. used to get you for sure. If Patrice oh, got I, you. I never worried about you, but Patrice, if I knew he was gonna be there, I would have like five things to say about him. <laughs> Like I would came in like locked and loaded just to, to try and hit him. Until and this I, day, and then, I, then I would I would be I'd say all five in the first minute, and then I was fucked. You know what, man? Until this day, I still don't understand how a funeral happened and they turned it into a comedy club. Until this day, Patrice O'Neill. How they turned it oh, that in. That funeral was great. That was one of I the mean, best shows I've ever been to. I've never, I've never seen anything like that in my life. You know, for our listeners, you Patrice bugged me at the funeral. You bugged me. I did. Because you showed did. up. You were wearing like a pair of Jordan ones. You look like you're going to do a spot at Caroline's. I'm like, and that's what I said. I go, Ken, this is a funeral, man. You're dressed like you're going to go do a spot at State Up New York. And you, this is what you said. You go, no, Bill. I'm dressed like the comic who made it. <laughs> said that at a funeral. I was like, I know this guy's an asshole. I didn't know he's that much of an asshole. You almost had me saying, well, I played Carnegie Hall one time. I almost said that at a funeral for my friend. That's how much of an asshole you are. <laughs> what the fuck? We went to Patrice O'Neill's funeral. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we had so many comedians. First of all, Patrice was one of the most loved guys, I mean, on the scene. Like all right, he, let's not throw too much. He was also one of the most hated, too. Yes, he but he was a comics time. comic. He was a comics comic. The comics loved you know, him. If you were funny, you loved him. Yes, if you weren't funny, you hated him. 
because he let you know that you you stood no chance in this business. He oh, if it weren't you, funny, you stopped working the village because that's yes. where he was. You stayed uptown. You didn't want any problems with that because he was the no. guy to go, ugh, this guy. Ugh, ugh God, who let? Ugh. I remember dude. Eddie If one time said, dude, he goes, some nights I'll walk into the cellar and he'll yell across the room, hey, Eddie. And he goes, and I think, ugh, he saw me. <laughs> Dudes like that used to come into the upstairs at the olive tree. They used to try to pick the first open seat to just, you know, slink in and stay away from them. The only other person that I think holds a candle to Patrice's level of 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 evil within within like that that angry tone is Nick Nick DiPaolo. Nick DiPaolo yeah, is Nick, great. Nick is a whole other level. Nick is. I Nick tell you, is on great. stage, uh, Corey Holcomb. Corey Holcomb is fucking, you know, it's amazing, dude. The shit that guy can say. Corey Holcomb has made how, me grab how, my chest. Huh? He's made me grab my chest. Like you know, when you're uncomfortable, you just grab your chest when somebody says something because you don't know how, like, how to take it. Corey has made me touch my chest. Like, oh god, oh, that's. Oh, he just sits there laughing. It's like, dude, this thing is literally. You have this audience on a thread right now, and that's gonna snap, and they're gonna rush the stage, and that's where he starts. That's what that's what he loves. That's yeah, what he loves. he's uh, uh, amazing. This is again, you're talking about a guy who doesn't get enough credit. That's Corey. That, oh Corey. my god, oh, I he's, think, been, he's been a beast for 20 years. But you know what though, I don't want to say that he doesn't get credit because Corey's done well in his career. I think. You don't want uh, to say that because I said it. Go ahead, Kev. Trash no. me. I get it. It's your podcast. I mean, listen. I mean, I just think that he's done. He's done fucking well. Corey's been a headliner. Okay, maybe more white people should know who he is. There, there was that okay? All right. Okay, Will I you understand that, that part. There you go. You that makes like more baby sense. LeBron. <laughs> what is your problem? Hmm? And I don't like that you're fucking. Where are you? What is this setup behind you? What fucking spiritual setting are you in right now? Yeah, what is I, you know, I have a house and I have children and I'm a father. What the fuck does that have to do with church glass? Yeah, what am I what supposed the- to do? All you fucking guys with your own vodka line and you have kids, it's fucking <laughs> hilarious. The showgirls skipping through with the stripper pole. Oh, that's my son. Next to the stripper pole? I'm a dad. This is what the fucking house looks like. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me, let me put my fucking hoodie up. Yo, you know what I'm saying? It's just, shit be crazy out there. Bill's got fucking, you got Catholic church glass behind you. I don't know what you're doing. Bill, who's your, who's your like comic? I never asked well, you that. Not you. I can tell you that. Why the fuck? What is your problem? What are you talking about? Why am I not on your list? You just don't do it for me. I like you as a person, Kev. I actually got on this, this podcast to break up with you. Kev, I really like you as a person. <laughs> but I'm done. I'm done. No, I'm going to tell you something. No, Kev, a lot of people think you're an asshole. Mm-hmm. Just going to get that out there. Yeah. They think you're unsightly. Wait, who, wait, who, who are the people, Bill? Everybody. Everybody's no, you're there. one of the most fun people to be around. My God. You, are, you have great energy and all. Occasionally when you come down from the Hollywood Hills <laughs> and you grace us with your presence, you are a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Every once in a while, you go back to the <laughs> and <laughs> you pick your head up from the Hollywood Reporter and just be Kev again. I mean, yeah, you're you're a good guy. Um, who are the guys that I like? Yeah, like who who are your comedians that Bill Burr is like? Fuck, man, no. You know who I love? Who? Well, I already said Corey. Uh, yeah. What are we talking? We're talking now or when I was growing up? Which it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, well, obviously prior. Okay. For his ability to go to really dark, sad places and be dark and sad. I've seen a lot of people joke about dark and sad. He'll go into dark and sad, being dark and sad, and have the crowd almost ready to cry and then come back out again and have them laughing. It's a great fucking analogy. I've never seen... I've seen... uh, Mike Epps is the closest I saw doing some stuff like that one Mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. Mike Epps is another guy... Um, as far as his ability to like paint a picture mm-hmm. and then also his whole vibe. Oh, wait a minute. You guys got a bunch of bullshit. I forgot about that. I, you guys really I don't have bullshit. Uh, what, in what world right, do so I, I have I saw bullshit. you gripping the microphone a little tighter. I'm sorry. In, I'm in what, white comedian so I don't start a controversy. In what world, Bill, do I have bullshit? You know that I can never have bullshit. 
Now, people have bullshit with me. That's You're fine. talking about this shit was online. You guys were, uh, what, do you, what do you people say? Snapping? Is that what you're you, doing? You people. What are you, are you playing, doing? Are you playing you're the gonna dozens? Go, you're going to go down for that. You people. Have we heard of well, inside well, jokes? Well, look at my brand. My beard is as orange as Trump's hair. <laughs> <laughs> that was right on brand. That you people was right on brand. No, I get um, what you're saying all about Mike. Mike is very funny. And, and painting the pictures, the stories, I get it. Who else? Um, I'm trying to avoid the obvious. The Chappelle's and all them, the Dave Attell. But I mean, it's like, not the obvious. I just want to know who you fucking like. Who are your people? It's not obvious. All right, I don't know why you're going to start yelling at me. I mean, I'm just asking a question. Trying to hang out, you know? Where does, where does Bill Burr's style come from? Because, Bill, what I think that you have somehow been able to do in no, a... Like you don't believe in me. No, I really do. In a craft no, no, that's I been... I I'm, no, no, no. Bill, I'm saying you have somehow managed to create your own style like you have a unique approach to stand-up comedy and it's it's not like anything that i've ever seen because you 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 walk this line of anger frustration with great point of view and shock factor it's like you're not you're not the guy that's just looking to say the crazy shit to make the crowd go, whoa, I can't believe he said it. It's like when a comedian jokes, and to our listeners, I'm not saying that this is something to be joked about, so fucking listen to the example. Oh, if, they got you scared, Kev. Well, I've been, you know, I've been they walking on glass forever. Scared. If a comedian were to make a joke about... What happened to the Kev I knew? I'm trying to fucking be Kev him. I so knew just said example. what he was thinking. All right, watch this. You, you, just, you just preempted to your fucking point with an apology. Because I fucking have to, Bill. Oh. I'm sorry that I'm not the Kevin that you once knew. Fuck. Get off of my back, you you goddamn... I'm sorry. You, you fucking... You're right, you I'm got, sorry. I, I forgot you became box office boy. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying... What you get for creating a brand, you asshole. Now they got right. something I'm, they I'm can shoot for. I'm being punished for it. Yeah, you gotta I'm, be rogue. I'm talking about you. Bald, like me. If if a comedian were to make a joke about rape, right? Nine times out of ten, most of those comedians are doing it just to get a whoa from the crowd. I'm saying you don't do that. If you're angry about something, there's a point of view about it. And then your breakdown of it, the shock factors all always come back. They come back to a place of common sense, common ground, and your POV. And what I like is that you've never deterred from that. Like, there is nothing that has made Bill Burr not be Bill Burr on stage. And when I watched you on SNL, I watched the fucking monologue, man. I was There's so... No blown. To curse, Kevin. What did you say? There's no reason to curse. When I say... I cuss a lot. You know that. It's because of my dad, though. It's not me. It's my fucking dad. Did See? you take responsibility for anything in your life? Nope. Because <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> No, no, I cannot. I fucking miss hanging out with you, man. It's, it's not my fault. I really uh, miss hanging out with you. Your monologue on SNL, it was so dope because you had a good time doing it. I had a that's, great time. That's what I took from it. I took from it that, yes, okay, he's saying something that nobody else will say, but he's right. And he's having a good time because he knows he's right. I'm not saying this for a shock factor, guys. This is why I love my job because you know I get to say me what I about want. That shit, though, as I never, I never look at the fucking comments, right? But about a month out, I was like, "All right, I think I got away with it. <laughs> let, let me take a look." And this fucking jerk off was trying to explain why that white woman bit worked. And first of all, I thought I was going to get in trouble for saying I was happy Rick Moranis got sucker punched on the Upper West Side. Like, I thought, who doesn't love that it guy? It was so good. It was so good. Um, I knew that one was during rehearsals when the band died laughing. When the so band's good. laughing, it's like, all right, they might not laugh here, but at home they're laughing. So this guy tried to say the reason why that white woman bit worked is because he called himself out as a toxic white male. It's like, that's uh, not why it worked. It's not. That's it not. worked because it's true. See, they don't have the advantage of me standing there seeing people, black people, Puerto Ricans, laughing before I get to me even saying that I'm a toxic... The, the part where I say I'm a toxic white male is to get white people like the dude who wrote that to come uh, along for the ride. Uh, so, and they can feel, you know, okay. Because you know what white people do, you know. 
You see, they go after dead white people so they can be, they can act. <laughs> the safest thing you can do as a white person. I am outraged by that white person who is no longer alive. That can say anything about what I'm saying. Yes. I, yes. Can, who can no longer hurt my career. Kevin, <laughs> please, Black Lives Matter. Yes, I get it. I am upset with uh, the vice president from 1750. Yeah, that's it. It's, a, it's the safe route. Yeah. I, I, there's nothing worse than a guy or, or a woman that's, that goes to break down what you do that has no idea what you fucking do. No. It, I don't think there's anything more frustrating than well, a person that wants to... What, that's what the problem with the internet is there's an answer for everything. It's not really? right, but there, any, any question you have, the internet will fucking answer. But there's no qualifications for putting information on the internet. You can, there's no libel... There's nothing. Everything can be presented as truth. And that's why if you give a moron a laptop, he's going to go on the Internet and 20 minutes later, he thinks the world's flat. Wow. I don't I, I hope you guys realize how brilliant that just was. There's no qualifications. That's it, it, what it is. I, saw this guy, I, have a, I have this thing in my podcast called Comment of the Week. Just like because mm -hmm. every week, you know, you're just reading shit on Instagram and just somebody. There's a, there's a certain level of ignorance, myself included. Mm -hmm. But then somebody. Just the holy grail of ignorance. This person, you know, was, they were talking about wearing masks, not wearing masks, right? And uh, so this guy wasn't wearing a mask. That was the video. So people write, just wear a mask. And then these all these other people, all these people who have it figured out, yeah. like, oh, yeah, whatever, sheep, whatever, you know, you know, go off to slaughter. And this guy writes, he goes, all you need to, to do to know exactly what the government's doing is watch that movie V for Vendetta. That's what he said. It's like, oh, is that what I have to do? Oh, oh, I thought I had is. to join the CIA and get in a certain level of security clearance. No, no. Evidently, I just have to watch V for Vendetta. It's right there. You guys don't even know it. It's right in the movie. Watch V for Vendetta, and then you'll know everything that's going on. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, the government's <laughs> just hoping you don't watch it. Yeah, they, they, they have been putting this in front of us for years, hoping that we would see it. Nobody watches it. Funny, I saw V for Vendetta. I think I have to go back and rewatch it. I don't now, think, I don't think I was paying attention. I've never fucking seen it, but now I have to after hearing that comment. All right, guys, we got to take a quick commercial break. And right now we're inside the mind of Bill Burr. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Com Better Help Profession. Now back to Comedy Gold Mines, hosted by Kevin Hart. We are back. We are back. We are back. And right now we're talking to my guy, Bill Burr. Bill, where you at right now? I'm going to make sure I ask you correct. Where is Bill Burr at now? I'm at my house, Kevin. Well, no, I'm it's saying what stand up. Question. What stand up? What happens when you don't prepare for an interview and you just show Why would up? I? My, work out my interviews. My interviews. My interviews are different. My interviews are fucking raw. Yeah, man. They're you're real. Different vibe. Yeah, I go off the motherfucking cuff. <laughs> <laughs> where Where are you at now? Uh, with stand up, are you still in love with stand up? Are you as happy as you were? Uh, in the beginning stages of it, are you? Hey, you remember that time Kevin Patrice told Kevin Brennan to shut his face? Shut <laughs> your face. <laughs> he told him to shut his face. Shut your face. And he just goes, Kevin, <laughs> shut your shut face. Your face. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> shut your face. Where are you at? The great ones. Are you still in love with the craft? Yes, I am. And I'm still trying to get better at it. Nice. Yeah, so there's a bunch of. Um, things that I want to talk about in a more honest way. So that's where I was at um, before all this bullshit happened. And now I do tours and I, I do stand up next to fucking highways. I just did, <laughs> I did a tour dude, through Texas. I did eight shows. No, I'm sorry. Eight days, 16 shows. And uh, the early show would, it was always dealing with like rush hour traffic, at least, at least in Dallas. <laughs> You just hear a oh, in Dallas, truck. it was such a great space, but it was it was better for like music. Okay. And then they had like you know it was one of those places was like outside, so it could like you know in regular times it could hold like three thousand people, but now they had like one hundred and twenty there, so everybody's okay. like all spread out in these little cattle things. And we were also in final approach to Love Field. So oh like, God! Yeah, yeah planes like, coming down too. Yeah, but there weren't, weren't as many because not as many people were flying. So okay. Uh, but I was psyched that I was at least psyched that I finally got to land at that airport. You know, I kind of like aviation a little bit. And that's where JFK landed. 
uh, before they whacked. How many shows? You did 16, 16 shows? In, in, oh, how long uh, ago? In, uh, in eight days. So I did, I did like, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I did four in Austin, four in Houston, and I did eight in Dallas. Insane. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. But, but it felt, I'm willing to bet, it felt fucking amazing. No, it didn't. Really? Because I was outside and it was cold out. And I literally halfway through the tour, I was joking with uh, Club Soda Ketty. I was going, dude, I swear to God, if my whole career was outside, I would have been retired by now. I just, I felt like I was tailgating like eight days in a row, just standing oh. out there. And, you, and you know, you had a tailgate, you can throw a joke in and then have a burger. But like, I had to be the life of the party for like, oh, <laughs> I can't, I don't want to see Burr Pale. He's already, you're already the whitest white guy I know. I don't want to see for me, that, Kev. You can't believe the fucking doors that open for me. <laughs> That's <speaking>. it. <laughs> doors that people of color don't even understand. That's the, you, you get them. Exist. You get them. They fucking open for burn. This is a fucking door. It looks like it's going they to heaven. feel the heat of my white hand. I swear to God, it looks like, serious. it looks like there's something amazing behind that door. It really does. There's nothing. I'm, it's just it's, a white wall, Kev. Whiter than my fucking pasty face. <laughs> 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 With uh, you, you released a, a special, an amazing special. What's the what's the goal for the next one? Like, is there with I want to work. I, I want to work the word heart into my special and spell it H A R T so you can sue me. I will fucking sue the shit out of you. I know you will. I'll sue the shit out of you for fucking. I don't know what the word is called, so I'm going to call my lawyer and find out what I'm supposed yeah, to say. Call him up. Yeah, I will fucking call him up, and I bet he tells me I'm going to text it to you and let you know why he'll be sued. Well, you're so huge at this point, Kev, to be sued by you would actually help my career. Man, I get sued. Just to have Bill. my name in the same sentence. Do you know how much I get sued, Bill? Well, like, you're, you're an asshole, so you probably deserve it. Don't I'm fucking come at me. I don't sentence. even know half the lawsuits. I don't even know what they are. They just come. I get sued so fucking much. I, I get sued so much. You get so sued much. by the white people in your neighborhood because your Lamborghini's too loud when you come down the street? First of all, I don't, I don't know if there's Look white up. people in my neighborhood because I don't talk to Look my it neighbors. Look at them. fancy cars thinking he's somebody in our yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> I don't talk to none of them. I've never talked to a neighbor. I swear to God, I've never had a conversation with a neighbor. You <laughs> probably don't like your 47 fucking Mercedes <laughs> vans out in front of your house. That's, Dude, I pulled up to your house. I thought there was some shine there from fucking, <laughs> fucking Saudi Arabia. I was like, is this an oil man's house? Or is this a <laughs> comic house? <laughs> you had a caravan out in front of your house. It's my fucking stuff. I got stuff. You got stuff. Don't act like you don't have stuff. You spend your money on shit. It's just uh, different I shit. I do. You got, Bill's got a kick. I do. I just don't have any commission. Gym. I just don't commission an oil painting of myself to hang over what the floor for a guest. What do you? What do you? What's your guilty pleasure? What is Bill Burr spending money on? Uh, you know, on aviation and. Uh, That's right. You fucking fly. Yeah. How, how often are you flying now? Uh, like two, three times a week. Are you serious? Yeah. What, what plane are you flying? I'm going for my instrument rating. What what plane so are you I, flying? I passed the written test. And then you have two years. I fly a Cabri G2. It's a French helicopter. I used to fly Robinsons. And, um, you know, those Robinsons are great helicopters. But, you know, it's technology that's from a lot of technology and, and, and aviation is old because it takes so long and so much money to get it approved. So <clears throat> these guys in France bought the R-22 that I was flying, took it to France, took it apart, analyzed it figured out all its weak points and then redesigned a helicopter. This thing is a work of art. It's a, it's basically a baby A-star. It's like a two-seater A-star. A-star is like what the cops and um, and uh, news people fly. It's the same type of thing. How does Bill Burr get into flying? How did that happen? Uh, Bill Burr was into conspiracy theory. Okay. Bill Burr speaking in the third person now. Yeah. Um, I got into conspiracy theory and I was reading about how the world's money is just sort of a giant Ponzi scheme. You know, like you and I, if we if we start a Ponzi scheme, we're going to jail. Yeah, yeah. But if you're part of the, the Ponzi scheme, it's just like, no, fuck you. Fuck you, we're too big to fail and all that. So I started getting paranoid that I lived in this city. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, this is true. I love it, go ahead. So I started getting paranoid that I'm living in this city that technically shouldn't exist because we stole the water. It's a fucking desert. And it naturally, naturally, Kevin, before global warming catches on fire for two weeks every year, that is now up to about six weeks. 
And I'm like, I can't even get out of this fucking city. Even when everything's working and the dollar hasn't collapsed, it still takes me forever. Can you imagine if the shit hit the fan? How the fuck do I get out of here? Up and out. <laughs> so you plan an escape. So you said, I'm, yep. I'm going to learn how to fly a fucking helicopter. I'm going to go up and I'm going to get out. So when, so when it hit, you just said, fuck it, I'm doing this. Did you tell your wife? Like, did you have, did you have to explain? I to your took wife? a couple of lessons just because uh, I wanted to see if I was into it, and I immediately loved it. I'm I am a closet gearhead. Okay. I don't, you know, I'm not good at fixing shit, but I will watch anything on the internet. Somebody fixing something from a vacuum cleaner to one of my favorite cars to somebody doing a rebuild on a helicopter. I think what those people do is amazing. Fascinating. Fascinating. And yeah. also, especially like in aviation cars and all that stuff, you got people's lives in your lives in your hands. So um, I got into that shit. So um, have you bought have you bought one or or attempted to buy one? Do you have any like planes or helicopters that you own? Uh, yeah, I, I own one. Good shit, Bill. Good I for you, man. Well, because I wanted to have a say and it cost a fortune to rent them. It's actually cheaper in the long run to own one. So I recently bought one. And uh, what I absolutely love about it is, um, you know, if you have an engine failure, you, you do what's called an auto rotation, mm -hmm. which is now rather than the main rotor drawing the air into the disc, it's now the, the helicopter falling. The, it's the air rushing up underneath is what keeps it turning. So you have to fall at a certain speed to keep it turning because if you're going too slow and your RPMs drop, then you're going to die. So on the R22 that I flew, <clears throat> I felt like the window was like this. This is the low RPM horn. Okay. This is over speeding it, which you wouldn't okay. give a shit if you did that in a real situation. I mean, cost you some money, but like, but it was just, it was just, you really had to get precise. So I got those down. And now with this one that I have, it, the, the, it's like this. And I, I wow, feel like so it's a big difference coming down on a cloud. And people don't understand, like, if, if you, if you stay up on them, how safe they are. Dude, you can literally be flying this way, see your spot stop in the air, turn around, nose it over, get your speed back, come down, hit your flare, and then level out. And what I like is you can bleed off all your forward airspeed, which is huge to me because I feel like, because this is what people don't understand, is, is planes and helicopters, this is going to sound obvious, but you don't really think about it. They're not designed to hit anything. So Helicopters. Helicopters. Or, or planes, yeah. It's, yeah. There's no crumple zones or airbags. Like yeah. It's all about weight and balance. They, it's designed to get up and fly. Yeah. So that's why you'll see these guys will get it on the ground and then, you know, they get hurt really bad. It's like uh, back in the day, like cars in like the 1950s and shit, there was no crumple zones and you'd hit something in the steering wheel. Everything came back. It just, just came inside. Yeah. yeah. You squirted out the side like toothpaste. So now they got it worked out. The engine drops down. They somehow with the physics that goes around you, like the level of shit that you can hit in a car and still be pretty okay is incredible compared to uh, back in the day, but aviation is still like that. And you, ne you never forget that. So it's, it's, it's all about, you know, like bleeding, get, getting that forward airspeed to just, I'd, I just love the fact that Bill Burr is in the aviation. I love the fact that your hobby is flying. And here's, here's the, the thing, Bill, the whole point behind this fucking podcast, I was having a conversation with some friends. And I said, you'll never meet people more interesting than comedians. I said, we're the most complex individuals alive. I'm serious. I've never had. You really think that? I don't know. Fuck yeah. Look at the, look at the difference in the individuals that we know. We can call them crazy. We can call them smart. We can call them uh, people who have conspiracy theories. We can have strong political figures in comedy that are, that are so adamant about one thing and not another. We have such a different level of personnel in our business. And people only look at the personnel as if they're just funny. But they're the most complex people walking the face of this earth. Some well, of them are I dark. Think, I think two things. Are happy? Well, two things that make, I think, people in show business fun to talk to is the level of travel you do. And you can travel and be closed-minded and, and be boring as shit to talk to. But if you have your, you know, your eyes open... And you meet all these different people. There's a combination of that and the fact that if you came out of prison, okay, 
There's like there's like two or three jobs that you can just go out and do, and they don't even ask what if you did anything. You could kill five people somehow in a technicality after 12 years in jail, get out of jail, go down to an open mic, and get on stage. And be like, ah, man, do five minutes. And then you're just up there. And then when people found out you killed five people, nine out of ten comics would be like, Yo, dude, you should talk about that on stage, yeah, man. You should, that, we got to do a bit about that'd it. That'd be some prior shit. Yeah, yeah. You got you to gotta discuss it. Yeah. Yes. You do that. I think he also could get into sales. Like, you could kill five people, get out on a technicality, and then be selling Kias by the end of the week. You can, you get, well, no, probably not, not cars, because they're going to do a background check, but like Tupperware or like, you know, some some type of door-to-door sales you definitely could dude, do. Salesmen are super in, really, because in, like, they have to read people um, the way, oh, dude, I, my brother was in sales, fucking amazing, one of the greatest salesmen I have ever seen. And his, he had a buddy of his, um, he had a thing like when he, they were selling health insurance, when he would be selling health insurance, he goes, if I knew I wasn't getting a sale, he goes, I would just start staring at the guy's hairline and just make the guy all fucking uncomfortable and shit. He'd be sitting there going, yeah, uh uh-huh. really? No, I understand it. I understand it. You know, uh, but maybe we can work out something and the guy will get all, you know, <laughs> touching his hair and shit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we're inside the mind of Bill Burr. This is Comedy Gold Mines with host Kevin Hart. Now, more from Kevin Hart on Comedy Gold Mines. We are back. I didn't know this we're was back. Not serious. Why did, what do you mean you didn't know, Bill? I have a channel. You do know I have a channel, Bill. Oh, Kevin, you don't have a channel. Seriously, I do have a channel. You. No, Bill, I have a channel. But, you know, I swear to God, you fucking comedians. I mean, what do you want me to do, Bill? Laugh out loud. Go to radio. Freedom. It's my channel. I want you to this run to freedom and start your right own now. Channel. Kevin Hart, oh, laugh out loud channel? radio. Yeah. Kev, you slip on one fucking bullshit thing off there. They're gonna, you think that's not your channel? That's well, their Kevin, channel. Kevin that's Hart right. could go, but my other shows would stay. No, no, it was my channel. Oh, okay. Yeah. See. Okay. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, look, Bill. I will tell you stuff. Ah. You ask me, I'll tell you. Stop making me talk about my personal business. When I inside the hey, mind, that's of why me, you have to fucking apologize because you're getting business with suits. Don't get in business with these people. Start why do you hate suits channel. so much? Why do you hate them? Because of my experiences with them. Are there any suits that you like, Bill? Uh, I liked Armani for a while. Okay, all right, Bill. That's not what I'm. Jesus Christ! <laughs> What's your relationship? Well, I don't know. I, I have empathy for him. I actually have empathy for him. Dealing with us crazy people, but you know, I mean, having to audit people, and then also while still being friendly and creating shit with them at the same time is it was sort of a weird dynamic. As a comic, where you just your whole thing is to be like, "That's bullshit." I'm saying that's bullshit. And then when you get to that thing, you have to be like, and they're like, oh, that's the other side of the building. That's those kooks down in accounting. <laughs> like, you and I, we're, we're bros. <laughs> Gotta deal with that shit. And be like, What's yeah. your relationship with your agents like? It's wow. better. It's better. Oh, Jesus. What, what just happened? Where did you just go? You just went to a dark place. No, because I was thinking, should I tell this funny story? I'm going to tell. No, I love my agent, but I will, I'll be, I'm not going to lie to you. I was at a premiere one time. And he came up to me, he said, hey, man, you killed a great job. And I was like, yeah, dude, you were great, too. I just, because it was, I thought he was in the movie. And then that's when we were just like, well, maybe we should. I only talked to him on the phone, so oh, I, I forgot what he looked like. Oh, God, he thought he was an actor. He thought his agent was an actor. <laughs> He's a good-looking guy. What can I tell you? Great head of hair. Oh my God! Yeah, Bill, man, you really crushed it, man. Good for you. You too, man. Wait, what? No, wait. You're kidding, right? Like, no, Bill, man. I'm your agent. I'm like, oh shit. I'm sorry. He didn't give a shit. We, we. That's like our running joke now. Oh, uh, how long have you been with him? Um, whenever uh, my booking agent went over to that agency is how long. Okay, I got you, got you. Three we share years. a lot of Bill. You know, we share a lot of the same representation. We have for quite some time. You do know that, don't you? Uh, well, Kevin, if you called me a little more often and shared some of your life with me, I guess I guess I'm I would have to call you. That. You should know that. You should know. I mean, it's I don't understand how you wouldn't know. I know. I know because I ask. And I was like, oh, that's everybody dope. Knows. Bill's got a fucking great team. Everybody knows it, Bill. Yeah, what are you talking yeah. about? Everybody knows it. You got a fucking great team of people around you. I know that because they're my team. Who do you like playoffs? Uh, this year? 
you know what? I am uh I'm a little a little definitely dis I'm heavily disappointed in the uh, NFC and just what we represent for football right now. It's kind of disgusting. Oh, the East? That, that, that was just one of the rare times where all five teams were either rebuilding or had a horrific inter- injury. I mean, it, it was disgusting this year. It, it really got to the point where it frustrated me. So this well, year, six and ten almost won that division. It 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 really <laughs> it really bothers me. But I think it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to beat the Chiefs, man. I, I think the Chiefs are going to fuck around and come out of it again. Uh, you know, I think with Pat, Patrick uh, Mahomes is he has that that he not only does he have like all the talent and the gifts and all of that, but he also has that charmed life thing. Yeah, you know, when I used to watch Derek Jeter, I was like, this guy is like he's unbelievable. He's he's like he's everything you'd want in a player, and then he also just had like that magic thing. Like, remember, like, I don't know you watch like baseball when that guy overthrew the cutoff man, and he ran and he ran. He was like over by like the the uh, the uh, on deck circle on the other side on the first base side. He plays short and he just grabbed the ball and went like that. And, and the dude on the A's didn't slide and he got the out. And it's just like I can't say that because that was just like a heads up play. But he just has that. He's got that thing. I, I just see Patrick Mahomes so many games he should lose. And he they doesn't. still win because, like, he just has. It's beyond being good. Well, I'm it's beyond you. being good. He's he's that guy is blessed. Russell Wilson has it too. I love Russell. Russell Wilson's my favorite. Russell Wilson has it too. What's it, but you're a baseball guy, though, right? You're not a football guy first. You're a baseball guy. I'm a hockey guy. And you're a hockey guy first. Boston. Yeah. That's right. They, Boston. Know, they can, no, it's Boston. You said it Boston. Right. No, no, that's wrong. It's Boston. It's B A W. If you want to say it right, you don't have to. Boston, uh, but they kind of ruined the sport. They kind of they they got too much of the fighting out of it and shit. They just I wish they just had accepted the fact that they were a rogue sport, and that you know the owners were just going to be multimillionaires. But for some reason, people always want more, so they're trying to make as much money as the NFL guys and hold people hostage for stadiums and all that bullshit that the fucking NFL does. Are you? Are, were you ever? Uh, did you ever play hockey? Yeah, no, it was too expensive. Did you ever play any sports? No, no. I did. Oh, yeah, I played baseball. I played a little bit of football, but and then I played pond hockey. What the uh, fuck is that? Jesus, Kev. Kev, you know something? If you don't know something, it's okay. Nobody's. Yeah, what the right fuck here. is that? Pond hockey. Know. What yeah. is that? Well, there's a pond, and when it we used to get cold enough before global warming, you would go out and you'd play pickup hockey. It was the oh, shit. Oh, sounds safe. It was the you shit. Well, skate. This is what you do. You take the biggest rock you can find, and you throw it up in the air, and if it lands on, on the ice and slid, and no crack, you know, a couple of cracks, you were fine. That's how you would test it. That, to me, is insane. And that shows what the kids today are lacking. There is none of that. The kids don't have the balls to play like that today. It doesn't exist because he's fucking. Uh, I don't know. I think that I think they're just doing new, different, dangerous things. You've seen these 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 kids? They do these front flips and back flips and no, walk, walk, no. I see top, kids. I see kids skyscrapers. I see kids are, fucking TikTok. That's what I see. I see kids TikTok, IG. I see them live stream. I don't see kids fucking do that. I can't tell you the last time I've seen my kids go outside without me making them go outside with me. Or for us to do something. My kids don't just say, we're going well, outside. In defense of them, if we had what they had, we wouldn't have gone outside either. Rightfully so. And I think, the, of course, that's part of the problem. The for, video games were two lines with the, like a ball. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. shit, they, they like, they're in the world. Yeah, the creative so, the, the creative is, is out of this fucking world for them. All right, with that being said, as a parent, does that make you want to pull back some of the things that are available for your kids to use and, and play with today? Are you going to be one of the parents that's no game? I'll try to do my best to have a balance because you don't want your kid to be like dressed like a Quaker and churning <laughs> butter. <laughs> that's just a recipe for an ass kicking at school. They got to know what's going on. Yeah. But both of my kids are going to know how to drive. My, I have an old truck. I have a 68 F100 that ships three on the tree, three on the column. Okay. okay. They're going to know how to do that. They're going to know how to change the oil on it. Um, my, what's my important? Like, what what's important that you know, you feel important? Like knowing how to catch and throw a ball, knowing how to Very hit important. a ball, 
you know. Uh, True story. You ready for this, Bill? True story. Learn how, to ri- learn how to ride a dirt bike, like knowing how to ride a motorcycle and shit. I like that Rambo stuff. Like, you know, when you watch like Rambo, they used to always make a joke how no matter what mode of transportation he showed up to, he knew how to use it. Knew how to do it. Yeah. So I would like, like them to do, uh, be able to do as much as, as of that type of stuff to just kind of see like a, a world outside of the house because um, I definitely, you know, I, I learned how to braid my daughter's hair, right? Because I just didn't want to be her white dad, you know? So. I can tell you, I can tell you that a friend of mine, this is like one of the most embarrassing things that I've ever, that I've ever seen, right? And he just, he just had to laugh about it. I was like, yo, you know, me and my family, we got bikes. We love to go out, man. And we, we ride, we go to like these little bike paths and we'll do like, you know, just a nice little family ride. I said, you should come. My friend's got like four kids. He's like, you know what? Yeah, that would be cool. We've never done anything like that. Let's do it. He says, I got to get his bikes. I said, well, come on, go down to the bike store. I said, my guy there, he'll give you guys like a nice little discount and stuff. So we go down there to get the bikes. His son, his son is like 16 years old. He gets the bike. The whole family's ready to go. His son oh, gets no. on the bike. Bill, his son could not ride a bike. I looked at him. Uh-huh. I said, are you fucking kidding me? I said, you never taught him how to ride a bike? By the way, my friend is filthy rich. Filthy rich. he is. He goes, he says, Kev, he says, you know I'm a great father. He said, but this just made me realize that I missed some things. He he had to say, I can't go today. Spent the day teaching his 16-year-old son how to ride a bike. Dude, I'm not going to lie to you. That right there is my biggest fear as a father. That's a fucking real thing. I I don't want to miss any of that stuff. And what I love, what I've been able to change, right? Because every generation, you know, you want to change, keep the stuff that work, changes. What I love about my kids is my kids are not afraid of me. Mm. They respect me, but they're not afraid of me. Mm -hmm. Like when I was growing up, you were afraid of your dad. Absolutely. (laughs) Dad came home. He came in the front door. You went out the back door. Like you just avoided that dude, if he was talking, everybody had to shut the fuck up. And listen. Yeah, so, and I've, and I've realized that so much of my anger came from the way I'm built and then being in that overbearing old school style. Because mm. my dad's a great dad. It's just like, there was there weren't like videos yeah. teaching you how to be a better, he learned that, sit down and shut the fuck up, you know? Well, why do I have to? Because I fucking said so. Like, it's just like, you do that to somebody for 18 years, they're going to come out a little resentful. <laughs> <laughs> and then the greatest shit, this is the greatest shit, is then when you bring that shit up later in life, in your 30s, to your parents, they always just say the same, oh, oh, I never did that. I my dad. I never did that. And my what dad. I learned, this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned, dude, is my perception of my childhood and my parents' perception of my childhood, neither one of those is true. Wow. Somewhere in the middle. Because kids put an unfair amount of weight on their parents because their parents are their universe. So little things to them. Wow. Hey, can I get this car? Nah, nah, come on. Nah, stop it. Like, that's your world. Like, but that was the car I wanted. And then, like, they're in their 30s. And I wanted that car. (laughs) Yeah, they would. And then they're sitting there going, I like, motherfucker, I had five kids. I was just trying to get through the day. So I, I think what I learned from that is I have to understand that little things are big things to my kids. So all I have to do is listen and, um, you know, let them say what they have to say, assess what they're saying. You know, obviously, if I still don't want them to be able to do something, if I don't think it's right, I'll still say no, but I will listen to them. And then, and then, um, and if I fuck up, I apologize. So well, like my, my, daughter, my dad, my, my dad is on key. Same thing. Same exact thing you're saying, right. but it's like, my dad doesn't have any realization of the shit that he did. Now me and my brother, we don't really give a fuck, but my brother was the one yes, who was really do. affected. You now do. my brother was affected, not me. Like my dad stole, he stole my brother's yeah, car. Listen, from the bottom of my heart, you're, you're a fucking mess. 
I'm a fucking. What are you talking about? You are, Kevin. Yeah. You, you are. You, you, I might have been close the to it. The reason why you work so goddamn hard, there's two reasons. One, you, you want to be successful, all mm -hmm. that shit, right? But you also, when you're fucking occupied, you, the smoke can't catch up with you. That's what I found in this pandemic. All my shit can't catch up to it me. It can't catch up with you because yeah. you're doing the next thing and you, you keep it. It's just behind you. And all it takes is a fucking pandemic to sit you down. You don't want to stand up gigs. <laughs> And you fucking clean the house and you throw out all your old shit. And then you're just sitting there. And then this melancholy, like from the first time in, in like maybe like a decade and a half, I felt depression really to come up on. Yeah. I was just like, what the fuck is this? I thought I was past all of this. And I, and I wasn't like, I built this great life, but I mm -hmm. didn't deal with this when you, other shit. When you sat down, you felt like all of that shit came or, or was able to catch up. Everybody was quarantined. The phone stopped ringing. There was no more emails. I mean, there was occasional bullshit or whatever, but it was just like I had nothing to do. Wow. And I just sat there, and this fucking shit came in like a marine layer. and just fucking settled in me. And my wife was up. She was, what's going on with you? I was like, I got, I got, I don't know, man. Like, I got the fucking... The blues are so I don't know I what the, I, I got the DPs, I got I the pressies. Yeah. I got the pressures on it. Uh, yeah, so I, I I played drums too, which is great to uh I Let guess off some or, steam. and also sort of avoid what you're feeling. Okay. <laughs> That's you're, once again. You're Will Ferrell and Step Brothers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh yeah. Oh dude, that, that fucking movie. That movie I, I one of the funniest movies, not only because me and my wife thought it was hilarious, my mother-in-law thought it was stupid. And she sat there and watched this with us. And she was going, this isn't funny. You think this is funny? It just made it even funnier. And then I knew that part where he was going to put his balls on the drum. <laughs> and that they were going to show his balls. It's one of my favorite things ever. I don't think I can. I don't, I don't think that I, well, I definitely know that I'm not uh, a depressed individual. But what you said makes sense, actually, though, about like moving so fast and shit never having a chance to catch up to you. And if it did have the opportunity, what effect on you would that have? Uh, all the shit that acts. Now, how much quiet time do you have over the course of a week? <sighs> like when you ride in your car, can you sit in your car and ride in it, not be on the phone and not have the radio on? I already know the answer to this shit. I used to tease about you on the no, phone. What were you doing I'm with the with you. I got, if it's not the the radio or the, no, I'm not even going, I'm not even going to lie. No. Yeah, because the demons, that's then the demons all of a sudden, like what made you become a comic starts coming up. Now, I'm, I'm kind of at this crossroads where I, I'm sitting there. Do you live with your demons? Mm. Uh, is there a way to face them and, and they do go away? Because that just sounds like some Dr. Phil shit. Yeah, but go away. One of the funniest inadvertent comedies I've ever seen in my I love the Dr. Phil show. But the fine Hear girl, me to stop doing heroin. And they're like, oh, okay. Thanks, <laughs> Philip. I'm fixed. Okay. But what do you mean when you say demons go away? Like, do you really believe that they go away or do you oh. just put them to rest? You can put it to rest, but if you want to wake it up, you can wake it the fuck up. There is no go away. I like how you just said that. That just got me amped up. Yeah, like there's, you there's wake the fuck up. Let's, come on, Kev. Let's go. Yeah, fuck but it's, it's true. Like there's no, there is no go away. You know, a person that was an alcoholic and decided to stop drinking, well, they put that alcoholic demon to sleep. But if they go and take a shot one day, what well, right. that alcoholic demon is going to fucking get up? So it's it's how you deal with the things that you yeah. know are your worst. Yeah, I don't think you, I don't think that you can. Uh... You, when people say, yeah, I, I let all my childhood shit go. It's like, you can't. Nah, yeah, you don't. You, you dealt with it. It's just, it's like, um, you know, I don't think pain goes away. I think it's always still there. It's just you're able to function more and more with the distance from the pain. But if you go back and relive it, That's that concerned. emotion is still going to uh, be in there. But... Uh, I did learn though. This is one of the hardest things I learned that 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 crying is a valid emotion, and it's so funny that men don't do it, mm -hmm. and you try and stop it, and that's what the shit just sits here. And the next thing you know, you, you're putting together a bicycle on Christmas, and it's it not working. Out. And then that shit that you should have <laughs> cried about, that shit starts coming out. And people, like, where is this coming from? It's just like, <laughs> oh, I got my ass kicked when I was eight. And I never dealt with it, so now. <laughs> 
I'm gonna tell you when I when I cried, my my, and this is the only cry that I can truly truly remember, in like the past, I, I'm gonna say seven years. Outside, no, my kids, my kids being born, those are like the little cool tears where you're just welling up. But I'm talking really cried after my accident. When I got home from the hospital, I. I got home and I walked outside by myself. Nobody was with me. That's the that's the only time. <laughs> listen, nobody that. was with me. I broke the fuck down so bad because when I walked outside by myself, it was the first like real steps that I've taken without people being around me and are you okay? You need anything? What can we do? How's that feel? Like no questions. I did it by myself. But it's the first time that I realized, I was like, oh, fuck. It was really almost over. You, you know what the cruelest thing about life is? Wouldn't you love to be able to stay in that mind space, my, that head space, and just really appreciate just being able to walk outside? Yes, absolutely. And, and, could, that you, and you were so happy that you could just do that, and you had this house, beautiful it, wife, beautiful kids, and it, and it could bring you to tears rather than getting comfortable. And, and getting used get to comfortable, it, and you constantly get... needing new stimulation. Well, the last crazy, time, man. last time I I had to let it go was um, a uh, one of my great friends died back wow. in August. So I'm able to talk about it because I I just cried for a week. I just said fuck it. I'm I I got kids now. I can't have this grief sitting in me. Yeah. And it was just like, and I really learned, and I actually think that that's one of the reasons why women outlive men is because they, it's socially, accept, they can break down in a fucking FUD ruckus, packed Applebee's, it's, it's okay. nobody's going to judge them, no, People come, they're okay. going to come over and comfort you. It's if okay. you break down in an Applebee's as a man... <laughs> Yeah, what the fuck is this problem? Jesus yeah, Christ. uncomfortable. Ew, Jesus. Jesus Whoa. Christ. Man. Yeah. Get, hey, I'm so out of I here. think that all of that shit, and it sits on your chest, and then one day you're walking, you fucking have a heart attack. <laughs> you just keel over. I love, I love your, I love just your, I love your mind, Bill. And, you know, we can fuck around and we talk shit all the time. And I know for a fact that you're a friend. I know for a fact. Yeah, but I know for a fact goodness. after this podcast, I probably won't hear from you for about six years. So? And the so next time I see you, you'll be like, I love you, Bill. Bill, yeah. I, I've always loved you. Yeah. That what does that mean? That's how we operate. Doesn't change. You up, I've come to accept that with you. You're going to put your hoodie up and you're just going to keep plowing forward. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to say some really sincere, heartfelt shit to me. Yeah. And then I'm not going to see you for about 18 months. Nah, we'll see each other. I'll bump into you. What are you talking about? You know, where, you know what the truth was and what you just said? What? That pause right before you started talking. That's, that's the only truth in what that, I just that said. That was the truth of what you just said. It's not true, Bill. I fucking love you, man. Now you're not even looking at me. You just broke yep. eye contact. You, Bill. All over you right now, Kev. Full court defense. Bill, no, that's three not. Three second violation. Bill, stop. What do you, <laughs> stop using these references. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. You're a black I figure I talk about basketball. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you guys just had the goddamn privilege and pleasure of getting into the mind of one of the fucking best to do it man i'm talking about bill burr bill before we fucking say goodbye i mean what i say dude you're you're truly one of the fucking good guys like you're genuine you're unapologetically you and you always have been and i'm always gonna love and appreciate you for that there was distance though I mean, what, you, what does that mean? Yeah, I know you're busy. I'm just fucking with you. I miss hanging out with you, dude. I miss the fucking old days when we were the all fucking broke. just, just and literally just at a table, shit. at a table with a sandwich, and just talking shit. What, like, you guys criticized the way I ate. I had to eat before I came to the cellar. After a while. Oh my god, ladies and gentlemen, you want to see something that just looks like it's inappropriate? Bill Burr eating a buffalo wing. Is something that will it's not inappropriate. I was going on. This is how bad the cellar was. I was gonna go on stage. I had my beard was fuller. I didn't want sauce in my face, so I was sitting uh, there. I was trying to eat the wing. I was going like, let's uh, eat like that. And then this asshole saw it. It looks sick. Actually started. I said, "Bill's dying." Then I went <laughs> down. Then I came back up, and it continued. 
And then for the, for the rest of my time there, every time I would have mashed potatoes as it was going to my mouth, everybody's dead. Look at Bill. Oh, Jesus. Ain't the way the potatoes are sitting on that spoon. Bill's sick. That's what we said. Bill's sick. He, he's not telling us. Bill's he dying. Said, he's dying. He said Bill eats his chicken wings like he's dying. <laughs> you know when somebody says some shit, you're like, oh, that's not going away. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't just a quick little jab. That, that was an overhand right, and my ears are going to be ringing for the next two weeks as people talk about Oh, God. It. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this episode. Once again, Please, please appreciate the mind that you guys just got to get into. I'm talking about.